launch of Sputnik 1 on October 4, 1957, triggered a seismic shift in the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. In addition to being a groundbreaking scientific and technical achievement, the launch demonstrated that the Soviets now possessed long-range ballistic missiles capable of striking the U.S. mainland from Russia, missiles that could carry nuclear warheads. Over the previous decade, the United States has spent billions of dollars building a sophisticated aerospace defense system to detect, track, and shoot down incoming Soviet strategic bombers. This included chains of early warning radars like the Pine Tree, Mid-Canada, and Dew Lines, squadrons of manned and unmanned nuclear-armed interceptors like the Northrop F-89 Scorpion, Convair F-102 Delta Dagger, and Boeing CIM-10 Beaumark missile, and the building-sized semi-automated ground environment computer, or SAGE, to coordinate the whole system. But Sputnik and its carrier rocket, the R-7, made all this infrastructure obsolete almost overnight. Intercontinental ballistic missiles climbed past the edge of space before plunging back through the atmosphere, their warhead re-entry vehicles falling on their targets at more than 20 times the speed of sound. No aircraft can intercept them, and even under ideal circumstances, the target has no more than a half hour of warning before impact. As the technology to build an effective anti-ballistic missile system did not yet exist in the late 1950s, U.S. strategy shifted away from aerospace defense and towards the policy of mutually assured destruction, or MAD. This involved maintaining a guaranteed second strike capability, meaning that a nuclear attack by either side would result in the total annihilation of both. At first, this was accomplished via airborne alert, wherein a number of nuclear-armed B-52 bombers were kept in the air at all times, protecting them and their weapons from a Soviet first strike on their airfields. Later, missile technology improved to the point where ICBMs could be based in hardened underground silos and, finally, carried aboard nuclear-powered submarines, forming the three prongs of the nuclear triad. But before an attack could be answered, it had to be detected first, and before the now obsolete dew line was even complete, the United States Air Force began construction of a new ballistic missile early warning system, or BMUs. Three BMU sites were built at Clear Air Force Base in Alaska, RAF Filingdales in the UK, and Thule Air Force Base in Greenland, as far north as possible to give maximum warning of an attack. Each site was equipped with three large fixed General Electric AN FPS-50 radars for initial missile detection, and a number of smaller RCA AN FPS 49 and 92 sets for finer tracking. The system also included a number of computer facilities both on and off site to process incoming data, which was routed to command and control displays at the Pentagon and in NORAD's underground headquarters at Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado. As designed, BMUs could give NORAD commanders and the US President 20 minutes from the detection of a launch in which to evaluate the threat and order a retaliatory strike. After two years of planning and construction, the BMU system officially became active on October 5th, 1960. But no sooner had it been switched on, alarm bells started to clang as the system immediately went into high alert. A missile launch had been detected. The acting NORAD commander-in-chief at Cheyenne Mountain that day was Colonel Robert Gould, and as he stared at the data pouring in from the Thule radars, he could scarcely believe what he was seeing. The system was detecting nearly 1,000 missiles fired from a site deep in Siberia, arcing their way over the North Pole towards the United States. Following protocol, Gould tried to contact NORAD Commander General Lawrence Cuter, but the general was aboard an aircraft and could not be reached. Gould then phoned the next in command, NORAD Deputy Air Marshal Roy Slemon of the Royal Canadian Air Force, based at RCAF North Bay. By the time Gould was connected with Slemon, the BMU's alert designation had reached level 5, indicating near certainty of a missile contact. Under NORAD rules of engagement, this gave Slemon the authority to order a retaliatory strike on the USSR. But several things about this alert struck Slemon as strange. While the actual radar returns indicated that the missiles were over Siberia, the computer reported them as only 3,500 kilometers away. Stranger still, the computer was unable to generate an impact point prediction, and neither the Clear or Filingdale's BMU sites could confirm the contact. But most puzzling of all was the sheer number of missiles detected. As far as U.S. intelligence was aware, the total of ICBMs in the Soviet inventory was four. Slumman sensed a false alarm, but he couldn't be sure. 
and if he hesitated too long, Norad's ability to strike back would be annihilated. But before Slemon could make a decision, Norad's chief of intelligence, Brigadier General Harris Hull, joined the conversation. Suddenly, something occurred to Slemon, and he asked Hull a deceptively simple question. Where was Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union? At Hull's answer, Slemon breathed a sigh of relief. Khrushchev was in New York, attending the United Nations. Reasoning the Soviets wouldn't launch a massive nuclear strike on their own leader, Slemon called off the alert. An investigation soon revealed the cause of the false alarm, which could almost be considered comical had it not nearly led to nuclear Armageddon. On that tense October day, the brand new, state-of-the-art, $1.2 billion BMU system had detected not a swarm of Soviet missiles, but the moon rising over Norway. Thank you for watching, and see you next time on Our Own Devices.